I am Cadet Second Class Madeline Strang. It's my privilege to welcome you to this 31st Annual National Character and Leadership Presentation. Our honored guest for this afternoon's session is Colonel Bree Fram. Colonel Fram, an astronautical engineer in the U.S. Space Force, is a co-editor and co-author of multiple books and hosts a podcast. She is also the former president of SPARTA, a nonprofit organization that advocates and educates about transgender military service. Colonel Fram is assigned to the Pentagon to lead acquisition policy development for the U.S. Space Force. Prior to recommissioning into the Space Force in 2021, she served in many Air Force positions, including a research and development command position, and has led security cooperation with Iraq. Bree came out publicly on the day the transgender ban in the military was dropped in 2016. She served through the reimposition of a ban from 2019 to 2021 and is currently one of the highest ranking out transgender officers in the United States military. Colonel Fram has appeared on ABC, NBC, NPR, and PBS News. She is a featured speaker on leadership, diversity, and inclusion. She's also a member of the State Department's speaker program that connects foreign audiences with American experts. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Bree Fram. Thanks, Maddie. So thanks for the very kind introduction. Uh, it is truly an honor to be here and to be speaking with you today. Well, I know the program says we're going to talk about from first to the future and the history of inclusion in the United States military. When I found out just last week, no, you're not speaking for an hour. You've got 25 minutes. I'm like, oh, crap. Um, maybe we're going to have to cut down some of that. So I have a little more time tomorrow morning. So if you really want the history of inclusion across all groups in the military, come back tomorrow morning for the first 10 minutes and then, then run away. I'm going to focus a little bit more today on my story and that of transgender service members and how and why that fits into the picture of why inclusion matters. Why does it matter to us as a military? Why is it not a negative that some people may believe it to be? And how do we as leaders use it to enhance mission accomplishment? But I want to start here. This was less than two years ago, two days after a 10-hour surgery that opened me up from here to here and washed out all my insides with chemotherapy after removing several organs. I was terrified. This was, as I said, this was two days later, and I was still terrified. Not that I was going to die, which was a, certainly a, a consideration before the surgery, but that I'd never put the uniform back on again. All of us come into the service knowing there will be a day we take the uniform off for the final time. We hope that it is on our terms. In many cases, it's not. That is the cost of service. But we want to get to that day where it is our choice whether or not we take this uniform off. And I did not know that I would be healthy enough to ever put it on again. But there is a reason that I wanted to stay, that I wanted to be part of this military service. And I hope by the end of what we get through today, you'll realize exactly what that is. So as I said, I had to skip uh, some of the talk I wanted to give about the history. And I want to focus just on a couple little things. First, the fact that LGBTQ people have been serving since the revolution. This is not a new phenomenon. It is simply the fact that we are more able to be in the open about who we are today. But you can go back, as I said, to the revolution. Baron von Steuben, a commonly heard name, one of Washington's most important uh, assistants who created field manuals that are still were in existence for the army for almost 50 years, just happened to be gay. Albert Cashier, next to him up top, uh, fought in the Civil War, uh, traveled over 9,000 miles, was captured as a prisoner of war, escaped, returned to his unit, and continued to fight. Albert was one of over 400 people who were 
assigned female at birth, and yet found a way to put on the colors of their country and fight. In fact, when he was nearly on his deathbed, he was put in a hospital and it was discovered what his anatomy was, and he was put into the women's ward. His unit, it was still around 50 years later, broke him out of prison, and when he died a few days, not prison, the hospital, which was kind of like prison, uh, broke him out, and when he died a few years later, had him buried in his uniform with full military honors. Or you have people like Tech Sergeant Leonard Matlevich, who came home from Vietnam to say that in Vietnam, the government gave him a medal for killing a man, and as soon as he came home and said that he loved a man, he was discharged and began the modern movement towards LGBTQ equality. But from there, we actually went backwards a little bit, put into place the don't ask, don't tell policy in the 90s that really put a policy in place that said, all of you, you need to hide. And what happens when we hide a portion of who we are? How many of you have a work self that is different from who you truly are? All of you know the cost of this tax, this tax that we pay on our mental energy when we spend a portion of it hiding who we really are rather than dedicating that to the mission. And for LGBTQ individuals, that was a really big tax. Because if they slipped up for any reason in the words that came out of their mouth or the actions that they took, they would lose their career for something that had absolutely nothing to do with their ability to serve. And you see President Obama signing the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell into law, and over his right shoulder, smiling bigger than anyone else, is Staff Sergeant Eric Alva. Eric was a Marine and the first casualty of Operation Iraqi Freedom when he stepped on a landmine. But for him to be there as a gay man at the shoulder of the President signing that into law was pretty amazing. And then 10 years later, at a ceremony in the courtyard of the Pentagon, you see the Undersecretary of the Air Force, who asked her staff to assemble a team out there to celebrate that 10-year repeal. And when she walked out, she looked, turned to her staff and said, there's no way any of these people are old enough to have served during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I'm like, no ma'am. These people are here today because Don't Ask, Don't Tell is gone when we create the environment that is inclusive, not only do people want to join, but they want to stay. That is one of the most important things you might be able to take away. When you are included, you want to stay. Inclusion is a retention tool. But the graphs on here are kind of important too, and get to the point that we've always been here, and right now, a recent poll within the last month came out and said that about 30% of Gen Z, you cadets, our recruiting age population, identify as LGBTQ. That's incredible. And it's not as though it came out of nowhere, because look at the other graph that talks about left-handedness. Do you think the a rate of left-handed people changed dramatically in those years? No, we simply stopped calling it a sin and smacking hands of children that wrote with their left hand and saying, you won't do that. That is wrong. And all of a sudden, you even out at a steady state. When you set the conditions, you actually get to see reality. So really important to know that we've been here, but if you want us to keep us here, we need to be included. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. But I want to start with two people that were really important in my life, Paul and Fred, or as I knew them, Grandpa and Granddad. Both served in World War II. In fact, I just did my promotion ceremony to Colonel at the World War II Memorial to recognize their service and my family's legacy. One of which was the most important things that I thought was, or thought was really cool was this was the first war in which all members of my family fought for the United States instead of against it. I can look back and say World War I, the Civil War, the Revolution. I had members of my family fighting against the United States, but these two men fought for it. And it was incredible, their example. Uh, Paul in the cap was a first lieutenant in the US Army Signal Corps. The claim to fame was truly his guile. Uh, he and 20 men got ahead of the Army advancing across Europe 
and rolled into the town of Salingen in Germany, a town of about 140,000 people. There are 20 men, two trucks. He demanded the surrender of that town, saying they were surrounded, with no evidence whatsoever to back him up other than fake signals intelligence that he and his men produced. And for the next three days until the rest of the army arrived, he processed thousands of German prisoners who surrendered from the surrounding area. Pretty amazing what he was able to do with just his wits. Fred, on the other hand, was a tanker. Fred rose to become the youngest first sergeant in the European theater of operations and liked to tell the story about personally getting yelled at by General Patton to take all that goddamn armor off his tanks because they had a target to get to and they had to move fast and you can't do that if you're weighing yourself down even though you're outgunned. So I had these amazing examples in my life, yet I had no idea whatsoever that I wanted to join the military. So as a kid, I had a friend, and this friend, uh, we built Legos, we had a lot of fun, I truly started getting kind of my engineering nerdiness out with this friend. Um, I, at this point, wanted to be a paleontologist, wanted to study dinosaurs, because those are cool, and my son today at 15 still wants to do that. We'll see. Uh, but this friend of mine made me watch an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation with him. I was like, no, no, that's dumb, I don't want to do it. But eventually I gave in, he was my friend, I was gonna do that, and I was hooked. It was the first moment my life changed like that. I'm like, I wanna be Geordi. I wanna make the warp engines go. I wanna help humanity expand into the stars and realize that vision that Star Trek showed us of an inclusive future. That part I didn't know at the time. I just wanted to be cool and work on warp engines. But it made a mark on me. And so I went to school. I got my degree in aerospace engineering at the University of Minnesota. And I started applying for jobs in the civilian sector. Wanted to work for NASA and failing that, uh, maybe for one of the big defense contractors and, and work on some cool, cool stuff. But I graduated in the summer of 2001. And we were attacked. And that was the second moment my life changed like that. I thought of my grandfathers. I thought of their generation and the sacrifices they made to give me the opportunities that I had. And I wanted to be able to help defend and protect those opportunities for future generations. I wanted to be part of something larger than myself and to give back. It was that meaningful for me. And eventually, after about 16 months of fighting lost paperwork and crazy diagnoses that weren't real, uh, I was able to join the Air Force. And it was awesome. Uh, Fred was the one to come give me my first salute at commissioning, and it was so meaningful to get that recognition. But clearly, you can see, I was not serving openly, because this was still 2003. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was still around, and it would be years more before the trans ban was repealed. And I chose to serve regardless of that. And maybe I didn't know myself perfectly well enough at that point, but there are things that were really important to me to be a part of. But now, to serve as my authentic self, to not have to pay the tax, and get to realize my dreams in the Space Force as the ultimate nerdy branch, which is phenomenal, and to have that opportunity to be there from the ground floor as we build what is a truly 21st century military culture is such an amazing opportunity. Something that I think we all have to embrace and bring in. And if any of you are Trekkies, I probably had the wrong model. I turned out to be much more of a Jadzia Dax, or now that I'm a colonel, I'm probably Janeway. Uh, and it was awesome, but this is just like the bookends of the story. There's a lot that happened in between. So they told you, you know, that I, I went in knowing something was different about myself. I knew somewhat who I was, but I couldn't let that out to anybody. No one could know. And so this day eventually came where it was time. And we made it through the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and still trans people couldn't serve. And historically in this country, trans rights are about 10 or 20 years behind gay rights 
And it was mentioned the organization uh, that I was formerly president of, Sparta, was formed after the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell to work towards that. To really to show that we aren't the boogeyman. We could take trans people in and meet with senior leaders in all the services and senior civilians at the Pentagon and say, you know what, we don't have a second head growing out of our shoulders. We wear the uniform just like anyone else. We serve for the same reasons as anyone else, and we just want the opportunity to do so authentically so we can dedicate ourselves fully to the mission. And though we thought it was gonna be a 10 or 20 year fight, we got it done in five. And so in June of 2016, I had a little bit of advance notice uh, that the announcement was coming that uh, the ban on transgender service was gonna be out there. So I let my commander know, no surprises, right? All, all of you know that, you don't wanna surprise the boss. Uh, I let him know a few days ahead of time, and then when this happened, where the Secretary of Defense was speaking, I was in my first tour at the Pentagon, and I thought about going down into the room and being a fly on the wall. Thought better of it, stayed at my desk, and I had an email ready to go to my colleagues, and a note to go on Facebook to the world coming out as trans. So the SecDef finished speaking, open service is there, people can come out, and again, a little bit of hesitation, a little bit of fear, what's the reaction going to be? Eventually, I did get up the courage to hit post, to hit send, and then I ran away. I found that gym that is buried well underneath the Pentagon, and I hopped on the elliptical machine, and I went nowhere faster than I'd ever gone anywhere in my life. I was truly worried I was gonna burn the motor out on that thing. Uh, but eventually, I knew I would have to go back to my desk and see what the reaction was. So I got there, I sat down, one by one my colleagues walked over to me, shook my hand and said, it's an honor to serve with you. I was nearly in tears because the honor was mine to serve with them. And I understand my privilege in that, in coming out at the time as a major, as a relatively senior officer, working with a bunch of fellow nerds uh, in being white uh, and also being still perceived as male at the time. That buys a lot, but by and large, that was the experience that almost every transgender service member had because what do we care about in the military? Look to your left, look to your right, is that person here for the right reasons? Are they accomplishing the mission? Do they have my back? And the answer was a resounding yes across the thousands of service members that came out. And this day was euphoria because that tax was gone. But it didn't last. This was the scene for me just over a year later. I was on my last day of leave uh, in a cabin in northern Minnesota with some of my high school friends. And my phone exploded. Calls, texts, everything. Have you seen what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? I'm like, no, I have no idea. But to set you back in the summer of 2017, what do you do to check if things are going wrong? You check Twitter. And this was a time of high tension with North Korea. This was the my button is bigger than yours to launch nuclear missiles. I'm like, all right, better check Twitter and see what happened. Well, the president had tweeted that morning. And he had tweeted that after consultation with my generals and military experts, please be advised the United States government will not accept or allow and then there was a 10 minute pause. I'm like, oh, shit, are we going to war? Did the North Koreans cross the DMZ? Is this what we can't allow? No, no, it wasn't that. It was simply that trans individuals can't serve in any capacity because we're such a burden and we have tremendous medical costs and disruption to the military, despite a year of open service with all four service chiefs testifying to Congress that there had been no issues. Did my commander in chief just try and fire me via tweet? How do you react to that? <sighs> really, what is, what is the next step? And so I, I took a first phone call I actually took and listened to was from the two star that I had just finished working for as an exec. Like, uh, you go fight this, we got your back. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> that means a lot. But the message we had to come up with to all the service members was, you know what the best thing you can possibly do to fight this? It is to lace up your boots, put your uniform on, go to work and accomplish the mission until or unless you are dragged kicking and screaming away from the thing that you love 
so much and the things that you care about. And that is exactly what we did. But still the thought was there, where did this come from? Out, this was out of the blue. And all I can think about is, it have something to do with stereotypes? So, surprise, art history lesson. You were expecting that in the middle of this presentation, weren't you? This is my favorite picture. Uh, this is the Fighting Temeraire. The Temeraire was a British warship that fought at the Battle of Trafalgar. It was recognized as the most noble and distinguished ship of its era. It sank one French ship and captured another coming to the rescue of Lord Nelson. But this picture, this is 30 years later, of the Trafalgar being towed up the Thames to the breaker's yard to be taken apart and sold for scrap. Now there's a whole lot of other meaning in this picture. But why, is, why do I use it? Why do I have it up here? Well, what is that in front of the Temeraire? What is that squat, ugly, little brown thing? That is the first steam tug pulling it against the current up the Thames. That represents the changing of an era. You could, in fact, say that even represents the breaking of stereotypes because you thought even though this most noble and distinguished ship of its day, it was obsolete. Why? Because for thousands of years, we had this stereotype, which aren't all bad. Stereotypes allow us to make quick decisions and think about things, but the stereotype said the fastest way to get from point A to point B was wind power. And now I have evidence right in front of my face that that is wrong and that is out there. That is something we need to change. We need to change the way we think about certain things. And though people may have been told that trans folks are scary, that we're broken, that we are incapable, that we're fragile, or that trans women like me couldn't possibly return fire because we are too busy weeping or thinking about what we're gonna wear that night rather than deal with the enemy right in front of us, or that transgender men are steroidal rage monsters that are gonna charge that hill at the right, or excuse me, the wrong moment and get everyone killed, nothing could be further from the truth. You had the evidence right there in front of you. And we have to be willing to accept that evidence. In fact, I was working uh, in international affairs at the time, and I had a boss that, after about six months, retired. And he called me into his office before he did, and he said, you broke my stereotype of who a trans person was just by showing up to work every day and doing your job. And I was like, whoa, sir, that's a really low bar. Why don't I just step right over that one? That's how outlandish some of it was, that we were simply incapable. And you had trans service members in every service, in every career field, at just about every rank, doing things at home and deployed around the world. Yet we have lots of people that still cannot see that that adds value to our military or still hold those outdated stereotypes. But though it may have been noble and distinguished to think that at one point, it cannot be anymore as we look to build the fighting force of the future. Back to the story. Eventually those tweets did turn into policy. The Supreme Court allowed that to go into place. And it kind of allowed it to go into place with an ax hanging behind my neck and that of all other service members. Because though there had been four court cases filed against it, and every lower court had ruled that the policy was unconstitutional or discriminatory, Supreme Court said, while that works through all the appeals, you can, government, you can go ahead and put this policy in place. No one new can come out. No one new can get in. And they had a clause in, in the policy that said, should the Supreme Court, or any other court for that matter, in a final ruling, find the policy to be discriminatory or unconstitutional, all people currently allowed to continue serving, like myself, during that interim, would be immediately thrown out of service. Like, well, that's a double bind. I, of course I want it to be found discriminatory or unconstitutional, but I don't want to lose my job. Thankfully, it wasn't too much after that that in one of his first acts as president, uh, President Biden signed an executive order, again reversing the policy and allowing trans people to serve openly. And a few months later, I was invited to Pride at the White House. And I don't tell this story to aggrandize myself uh, or anything, but 
there's both some funny aspects and there's the fact that representation matters, which is not a new concept. The fact that if you can see something, you can be inspired by it, and even better, you can be it. And potentially, you can even go further. Go back to the inauguration of President Garfield in 1881, and standing at his right-hand side was Frederick Douglass, then serving as the Marshal of DC. And he said, and I don't want to get this quote wrong, that I rejoiced in the fact that a colored man could occupy this height. The precedent was valuable. Though the tide that carried me there might not soon rise again so high, it was something that had once so risen to leave its mark on the point that it touched and that not even the hoary locks of time could remove it or conceal it from the eyes of mankind. He knew how powerful a symbol it was to see someone, to see an African American standing at the right hand of the president at inauguration and to give others something to strive for so that others could see me as a trans service member get saluted by the president, called out and saluted, and when he did it, he called me out, I didn't know this was coming, and he saluted me, and I'm like, oh my God. And then I turned to my wife, and I'm like, please tell me you got a picture of that. And she's like, no, I was too busy clapping. Uh, and I'm like, oh, well, there's a thousand cameras in this room, surely there's a good picture of this. But no, this is the grainy YouTube capture from the White House feed that was the best thing I could find. And as the president walks out of the room, there's an aisle between the sections of people there, and he just looks at me, and he's like, I'm like, I'm like you got that one, right? And she's like, nope, not this time either. <laughs> and she hates it when I tell that story, but she had a great point. All she would have captured was the back of my head. Uh, but the point of representation and recognizing the people among you from groups that have been historically discriminated against and holding them up for others to see is critical. And it is a factor in creating an inclusive environment because everyone sees that there is someone they can be, someone they can be like, someone they can do even better than in the future in what they're able to accomplish. And this is kind of the heart of it. I know I'm running out of time, but I want to ask you a couple of questions. Tell me which pilot is trans. Tell me which one is Hispanic. Tell me who's female. Who does it matter to? Does it matter to the troops on the ground that these two are saving from the worst day of their lives? Does it matter to the wingman who has trained with them for years, if not decades, to perfectly execute the mission? If it doesn't matter to them, why should it matter to us? How do we create the inclusive environments that allow us to bring in and retain the widest possible pool of talent? This is what's so important, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter in terms of mission accomplishment, but it matters for leaders who can say, I see you, and when that identity is important, I can recognize who you are and give you the individualized consideration and that inclusive piece that makes you want to stay. And in the future, we are going to fight and win wars with brain power. And if those brains happen to be in a trans body, or in any other body, you should want them serving alongside you. Because they might be the one that revolutionizes the way we fight in space, in cyber, or in any other domain of war, and they are there for the right reasons. But it's not easy. It's not easy for any of us today. And for any leader to understand, again, truly what is going on with your airmen, your guardians, your, any, your anyone, Sometimes you have to dig a little deeper to find out what's happening. This is one week of online hatred that I received, and this is the tame stuff. I know you probably can't read much of that, but I'm a cancer to the military. I make a pageant of being psychosexually insane. I'm a sad joke, an abomination. I'm a member of the least intelligent, and I will end up in a body bag if we go to war. How do you deal with something like this? How do you know if any of your people are facing things like this? It's hard, but inclusion is an act. 
know, the diversity around us for the vast majority of us is a fact. But inclusion takes action. Inclusion requires asking. Inclusion requires understanding. And it is more work. It is a lot more work for a leader. But I need you to be willing to do it and to understand when your people may be going through some things that you may not see on the surface. And if they screw something up, maybe don't jump down their throat for immediately screwing up that one thing, but ask, is there something else going on? Something I should know about, something you might need help with. So where do we go from here? We need to create the environments that allow everyone to lower their shields, to not pay that tax that they are paying to protect their identity. This first sergeant, when her entire career in the Army before transitioning, and she says, I made mistakes, I screwed up, I did a lot of things badly because I was too busy protecting myself. We have to get rid of that and we have to do what this first lieutenant has done, who it came out and is herself because she knows that matters to the people that she leads and if she is treated well, she will stay. So what can you do? Well, in writing my last book, uh, my co-author and I were stuck with some mouthy language near the end and we kept writing things about what allies and advocates and, and leaders should do to take care of people and to be inclusive. We're like, ah, there's gotta be something better. So we chose to ask our AI overlords. This was right after Bard and uh, ChatGPT came out and we're like, please give us a word that best represents leaders, allies, and advocates. And it was like, yeah, of course. And somehow all the models agreed that the word that represents allies, leaders, and advocates is champions. So I am asking you to be a champion, to use your influence and your leadership skills to drive positive change in the areas that you can. You have to support marginalized communities and mobilize others and speak out when you see things that are wrong. And if you do so, you are gonna create those inclusive environments, not only that enable people in, to stay and to want to stay, but to bring you their problems because you're then seen as human and then as creating that environment where people are willing to bring you their issues. And if you as a leader, as a commander, don't know what your people's issues are, you can't help fix them. Hopefully they bring them to you and if not, inclusion is an act. Ask. So I want to wrap up on, on Fred's story because there's something I didn't tell you about Fred. Fred was a refugee. Fred was a German Jew who was one of the lucky few to get out in the 1930s. Where would we be if we turned away talent like his? Where would we be if we didn't create the conditions that allowed everyone who wanted to serve to defend these opportunities that they had. And I told you that Fred gave me my first salute at commissioning. And as he grew older, he got to know the real me. And he loved me and he accepted me. And what was so amazing was that every time I got promoted, he'd be like, oh, wow, a, a captain, a major, a lieutenant colonel, that's crazy. And he'd get that same big wide-eyed smile every time we had a conversation and I talked about my time in the military. But when the Supreme Court allowed that policy to go into place, they set a deadline and the day before I was to go in, I was on Capitol Hill speaking with some legislators about what the impacts would be and if there was anything that we could do about it. And right from there, I had to pick up, drive to New York, get my family, and then drive back to Minnesota for what was supposed to be Fred's 95th birthday. I got home. And my mom said, I think you need to go see your grandfather right away. He's in the hospice. And so I did. My family's there. And I, wake in, or I walk into his room, and he's in a hospital bed. And you can see he's, he's not with it. Uh, he's got a lot of drugs. But I go in, and I, I grab his hand, and I squeeze. And he opens his eyes, and he gets that same big, wide-eyed smile. But then he kind of floats back away. And I sit there for a couple hours as family comes and goes and eventually I, I too had to leave. But I wasn't gonna do it without trying one more time for this person who, who knew and loved me. And so I grabbed his hand and I squeezed really hard again. And he came too. Same wide eyes, same big smile. And he looked at me and he said, keep doing what you're doing. And those were the last words he ever spoke. He passed the next morning. 
So I ask you, I am so proud of all of you, but to keep doing what you're doing, to create these environments that allow us all to thrive, to build the type of military we need to win in the future, and to create those inclusive environments that matter so much to so many of us. And with the few minutes I have left, I would love to take your questions. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, after the tweet that went out in 2017, um, I was wondering how you handled like your feelings while being in the military during that time period of this uncertainty. Like, were there periods of anger? Were there periods of despair? And how you ended up handling that during that period? It was a tough time. It was a, a very difficult time. And honestly, it we haven't left that time because while I don't have a crystal ball, I can look out and say, well, either next year things are gonna be great or I'm once again going to be fighting for my ability uh, to continue serving. And I think if anything it, that speaks to trans service members and any service member that has faced discrimination or policies that overtly uh, exclude them in one way or another, think about their resilience that you have to have to get through those times. You know, we can talk about um, the Tuskegee Airmen and the fact you know, that you were not allowed into officers clubs or you, know, you still had white only stuff, even though they were the greatest thing any other airman could see, a B-17 pilot could see on their wing, making sure and making sure they come home safe. But when you have to fight for that, you fight for something that again, if not me then who, how do I fight for something and how do I show every day that we belong? So what we had to do really was take every day as a gift. You know, the old adage that they don't call it the present for nothing, but take it as a gift to change hearts and minds merely by our presence in some cases. I told you about the boss that like, just by showing up for work, you changed my, my mind. But there are countless examples of that where people who were then out were able to keep working towards something. And again, even if we had been thrown out to set that example that the hoary locks of time could not remove. And so for those of us that were senior, it was even more important because we had access to people and places that others didn't, and we could fight for better policy, we could fight for change, and we could, in essence, try and eliminate the barriers that the people coming up behind us had to face. But it was tough. Um, and for anyone who has ever done advocacy work or tried to fight on, for something better, you know advocacy work is burnout work. So we all had to try and take care of ourselves, and uh, we lost some people. We did, um, but everyone had to find that thing that worked for them. For me, it's coming here to Colorado and climbing mountains in the summer and skiing down them in the winter, so I made sure to do that. Um, I'll be back here in two weeks to do that again, uh, but that's really what it was all about. How do we fight for the next generation? How do we leave a mark or an example, even if we're not here to finish it out? Good afternoon, Colonel. Um, my name is Cadet Ubias, and I'm from, uh, from the University of New Mexico. And I just have a question. How can I, as a cadet, um, use my, I don't know, my position, anything I can to support, to support my fellow colleagues as much as I can? So I think one of the best things anyone can do uh, just to, to be an ally, there, we, we talk about you know, speaking up, speaking out. If you, if you see something wrong, create those inclusive environments um, if you see someone who might be feeling left out or different, invite them in. I mean, it, it really can be as simple as that sometimes uh, to set the conditions where everyone feels okay to be themselves. Uh, and, and sometimes it is simple as a, hey, how are you? Uh, so all of us can do these simple things that are acts of inclusion to bring others in. Mm -hmm. Colonel Fram. Thank you again for your time today. Your experiences and presentation truly speak to how we value human conditions, cultures, and societies. 
On behalf of the U.S. Air Force Academy and our National Character and Leadership Symposium, please accept this token of our gratitude. The base of this gift is made out of marble from our terrazzo. This is foundational to us because all cadets have had to run the marble strips during their freshman year. We hope you will look at this and re remember your NCLS experience fondly. <laughs>